I'm basically going to tell some startup stories today. Uh, so we've had a crazy run. So this this picture here was taken from security footage in our crappy office on 22nd and Mission in, in San Francisco in spring of 2010. And so what had happened on this morning was uh, I had gone out for my coffee on Mission Street, just like I had done for literally 10 years running this business that I was running at the time. I came in, I logged into Google Analytics because this is what you do when you're running a consumer web business. And overnight, we had lost 70% of our millions of users, overnight. Um, and so what had happened was something called Google Panda. Does anybody remember Google Panda? Anybody associated with demand media, they probably remember Panda as well. So it was basically a search engine update where we used to rank for everything in search, and then we woke up one day, this day, and we ranked for almost nothing. And it was a, a devastating, devastating blow. And, and I, I realized we couldn't save the thing. Like, the, we were going to run out of money, we were going to run out of time, so we had five months to figure something out. And so what I did was uh, I ended up going to a bar. Um, and the bar is called Double Dutch. It's a hip-hop bar. Uh, so yes, my company's named after a bar in San Francisco. Um, so I went to a bar and I started thinking about what, what could the next thing be. And so I think there, there's different ways to start a company, right? There's the, the sort of the, the, the passion, the vision, there's the Dennis Crowley, like he's always ever wanted to do is hack cities. And so whether it's Dodgeball or Foursquare, he was going to do that business at, at one time. And then there's the kind of like scratch your own itch way to start a business where if I, if I heard right, the, the founders of Hipmunk were on orbits having a hard time booking a flight and they're like, this sucks, we can build a better website. And so you solve your own problem. We did something a little bit different. So we, we had a very sort of coldly rational way of looking at the world and we wanted to find disruption. We wanted to find a point where things were changing. We wanted to find a growth market and we wanted to build a product to drop into that growth market. So what we found was mobile. And it, it's not like we didn't have passion. We had, we had some patents and location-based services. We had, a, I had written a successful blog on this area. So we, we did have the passion. But back in 2010, there was no expression mobile first. So what we decided early on was that we were gonna build something that couldn't have existed before the smartphone. We were gonna build something for work, because at the time, everybody was building consumer stuff. And we were gonna build something that was social. And so that was our thesis. And so this turned into a whole worldview where we started thinking about, okay, how can physical world, face-to-face -face interactions combine with digital to create a third way? And so the next thing that we did was we built a couple of prototypes. And we built three prototypes. So the first one uh, was this app called Pride. It was a mobile collaboration and messaging app for work. Might sound familiar to you guys. It sounds a lot like Slack. It has crossed my mind that it sounds a lot like Slack. Uh, so we had a, a thousand companies using this app in about two weeks using it all the time. I didn't trust myself to be able to fund the thing, so we killed it. The second product that we built was a mobile CRM, and this was the one that people were really excited about. Use contextual triggers on the smartphone to surface the right opportunity for the right sales rep at the right time. It made updating Salesforce a five second operation. Uh, we got funded on this, we had a lot of money come in on this, uh, and we ended up killing it. And then the third thing we built was this mobile events app called Flock. And so that, so that was sort of our experimentation phase. And so this is what the company looked like. In January of 2011, we incorporated, we just barely made it. Like there was, a, there was a gap between us running out of money from our old company and starting this new one. I covered payroll out of my pocket without telling my wife, not, not recommended. And so if, I, if we had lost one engineer in those days, it would, have been, it would have been lights out. And so we stayed just like this um, for a while. In June, in June 2012, we started adding a, a couple more folks, but for a year and a half, we were basically seven or eight people, mostly technical. 
And then in January of 2013, this was the moment. We had conviction. We killed two products. We focused one thing. I'll talk about that in a second. And we hired six 23-year-old SDRs to start making 60 calls, uh, 60 calls a day each and calling event planners. And this was a crazy time for us because we took a mostly technical group and we dropped in this. We dropped in SDR and it changed the company, but this was a moment that we started to accelerate. By October 2013, we were growing like crazy. We attracted the interest of Bessemer, so Byron Dieter heard about us, uh, dropped $10 million in. By April 2014, we were growing like a rocket ship in Europe. This is our, our Amsterdam office. Why Amsterdam? Because we're called Double Dutch. We had no other options. Um, by September 2014, we were a freight train. We were one of the fastest growing companies in the world. You'll note how many people are wearing the Double Dutch hoodie. At this point, we were walking around with so much swagger, having survived so many near-death experiences that everybody wanted to wear the hoodie all the time. By September 2015, we were uh, well over 200 employees on the Inc. 500 list of fastest growing the companies in the, for the second year in a row, uh, um, the Deloitte uh, 500 fastest growing companies as well. And so we were kind of like feeling unstoppable. And so I feel very privileged to have been on this ride and just hearing the stories from Thrive as well. It's like I had done a bunch of bootstrap things, but I'll tell you guys that when it hits, it really hits. And you should appreciate that. So this is, this is some data from Y Combinator that of the applications to YC, 2% get accepted. Of those 2%, about 6% of those will ever make it to $40 million valuation. So 1.2 out of 1,000 get to $40 million valuation. And those are sort of the odds that are against all of us. So if you get a chance to be on one of these rides, you should definitely do it because it doesn't happen to most of us. And so the reason it doesn't happen is that there are so many things that can, can kill you uh, when, you're a little, when you're a little startup. So the, the, the problem with being an entrepreneur is that you are having to make so many decisions every day. They're flying at you, and most of them don't matter. You just got to go. You just got to ship, and you got to go. But every once in a while, one of those decisions, if you break the wrong way, it's going to kill you. And the problem is you don't know what those decisions are until they've actually killed you. Um, so for us, there were a couple things like that, you know, at the time, 2011, 2012, you'll remember Facebook was still betting on HTML5. They thought that native apps was a blip, that writing once for every platform was the way to go. And so we, we bet on native, even against the interest of our own engineers who are like, God, we're staying up all night writing for three operating systems, like the, you're going to kill us, Lawrence. Uh, but we bet on native and that was the right call. Facebook eventually came around as well. Uh, freemium versus enterprise sales. At the time, Yammer was the, all the rage, and, and the legend of Yammer was that they did not have any salespeople, and they were still growing really fast. So the temptation was not to hire salespeople. We didn't believe that. We hired salespeople. If we had gone freemium, we would have died. The third one was multi-tenant versus bespoke. What we do is we actually cut individual apps for every event. It was a, it was a clunky model. It was considered a clunky model. If we had built one app for every event, we would have died. And then the final thing was we learned that if you try and tackle Salesforce head to head, you're gonna die, they're gonna copy you. They're gonna copy the best part of your business and they're gonna do it better than you are and they're gonna kill you. So these were the things for us that, that could have killed us and we, we, bet, we bet right. So what I wanna do for the next couple of minutes before we get to Mark Cuban is just go through a couple things that, uh, that I learned along the way um, that hopefully will, will, will help you guys a little bit. And so the first one um, is focus. And so I want to bring you back to December 2012 when we were a team of six or seven engineers and we were building three products that were sold to three different parts of the org chart that had to be written in three different oper operating systems, so iOS, Android, HTML5, and, and we were dying. So, I mean, it was impossible, right? So what we did, we had just raised a round of funding from Floodgate and Mike Maple, so celebrity investor. We had George Zachary in our cap table as well from CRV. And they were saying, you got to focus, you got to focus. We were like, okay, we're going to focus. They said, great, you'll be a CRM company. And we said, great, we'll be an events company. I almost got fired over that, right? Because I literally had just raised $2 million on the premise of, of beating Salesforce with a mobile first version of CRM. But we had conviction on the events thing and we focused. And that was the moment, that was the moment that once you focus, it is so liberating. Literally, the moment you know what to put on the website, you know what kinds of people to hire, you know what features to build. So if you're trying to do multiple products as a small company, you're doing it wrong. Uh, and, I, and I have a lot of conviction about that one. 
The second one, uh, challenge conventional wisdom. Um, so our Europe team, we opened up Europe when we were tiny. And literally, our most famous investor, Byron Dieter and Bessemer, he has written a, 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 a laws of the cloud blog post where he says, do not open up Europe too early. So we had our, our mega investor telling us, you're making a, a, a deadly mistake with your company to do this. We did it anyway. It carried us in the early years. So we went from zero to a million bucks in bookings in just a couple of quarters. So you got to pick your spots, but sometimes the old rules and the way it's always been done don't actually apply anymore. And we were, we were lucky on this one. Um, third thing, hire better people, hire people that are better than you. So I'll tell one story from one of our early hiring decisions where um, we were a small team and we were looking to hire a director of product. And we had two finalist candidates. We had a scrappy uh, sleeve tattoos guy from our neighborhood who worked for little startups that we admired and appreciated. He was very, very good, very, very strong. And then we had this VP level guy who was employee number 40 at LinkedIn who was hired by Reed Hoffman and is like one of the better known product guys in the Valley. And like, who do you hire? Like, honestly, we were torn. We were leaning towards the one that was a better fit for us at the stage, but I can't imagine us surviving if we hadn't gone for the big hire. So I'd, I'd encourage you guys to have at least somebody on your management team who's done it before. That hire was a crucial one for us. Okay, fourth one, uh, documenting your values. Um, so way back in the early days when we were 12 employees, we took everybody to Monterey. Uh, we took them to the beach, we went camping for three days, we drank too much, we stayed up all night, and we started to document the company that we wanted to be. And it's, it's hard to explain, it sounds like a silly HR thing, um, and it's, it's not something that's gonna help you get to product market fit, but if you don't do this early, it can kill you. Culture can be one of those things that kills you. And so when you hit that product market fit moment and decisions are flying at you one after the other, after another, it helps to have a framework for how to process those decisions. So things about hiring, things about how to deal with problem customers. And if you have values that you've documented that your employees believe in, that can help you filter these decisions as they're flying at you. So I, I, I recommend it. It feels like, again, it feels like squishy feely stuff, especially for the technical folks in the room. But without it, uh, you're, you're kind of trying to make every decision in a vacuum. And then the last one, I'll, I'll, I'll channel my, uh, my inner Peter Thiel here where, um, you know, and there's actually just a, gr a great post uh, by Fred Wilson about the, basically the return of the hard race. So when you hear a guy like Nick with Thrive Market get rejected 50 times in a row, we were rejected 45 times in a row as well. Um, part of, one of the possible explanations for that is that you're really early on a big idea and you're not following everyone else. And this can be a really powerful thing. So at the time when we founded our company, all anybody wanted to talk about was Groupon and like white label coupons. It was, it was coupon mania, right? And so every smart uh, entrepreneur in the Valley was working on coupons. It was crazy. And so for us to do something that was enterprise, there was no class out of YC for three years that was a B2B software company. So when you feel everybody going one way, it might not be a bad time to look at the other way and see if there's a way to make it work. And I, and I honestly believe that if you can avoid competition and find a big market, that you're, you're onto something special. So this is, a, this is where marketers spend their money. And marketers spend twice as much on events that they do on digital advertising. And this was my money VC slide. You show this slide and the VCs look up for their, from their phones. They're like, what, there's no software companies that are optimizing a $565 billion global spend? Uh, and so if you can find these sleepy, old, boring markets and inject new thinking, um, there can be really interesting outcomes. Um, and then the final one that I'll bring up is sort of a later stage issue, but uh, you know, there, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise in what we do. I'm sure everybody in the room has lots of competitors. And the question is, how do you elevate yourself out from that noise? And on the B2B side, if you can elevate yourself, you can raise your deal size. You can charge a little more. And this is a big deal. When you're looking to actually focus on unit economics and build a profitable business, the ability to charge more is important. So about a year ago, we undertook this, 
this project that was called category design. We actually worked with an agency on it, but our challenge was that we were considered a mobile event app, which is a commodity, and folks want to spend $4,000 for it, and that's it, and these are the same folks that are buying the bagels and, and making sure the lighting works and all, all this stuff. And we felt that we were more than that, and we needed to get our ACV up. So we spent basically a year inventing a category of marketing called live engagement marketing. And it's really painful, and it's hard work, and it's hard to get everybody to run the same direction. It's hard to educate a market, but uh, if you find yourself um, struggling to separate out, investing on this, in this discipline of category design is a big deal. All right, so those are, those are my big six. So, so focus, and I was actually just in a board meeting yesterday for a friend of mine's company, and he had this really compelling vision about how they were gonna string two products together. And I, and I reminded them they had three engineers, and like, how can you be working on multiple products at the same time? And I think that this is, this is one of those things that will kill you. So think, if you find yourself stretched too thin across different problems at your startup, really think hard about this one. Challenging conventional wisdom, this was the EMEA example, so we went global early, it paid off. Hire people better than you, document your values early. Boring plus big markets equals awesome, and then design your own category. So I'll end with a slide about us. We're, uh, um, we're, we're growing fast. We're offices in Amsterdam, London, Portland, Phoenix, San Francisco. We think we're solving a big, interesting marketing problem. We are hiring in all locations right now. So if you have friends looking for a job, send me a note. Um, and that's all I got. So I'm, I'm excited for Mark Cuban, just like you guys are. So let's, let's set that up.